Uh, no, I do not think that this will pave the way for a more nuanced approach by the United States. American politicians need to continue exacerbating tensions between the US and China because when you think about it, war is the ultimate financial reset if you win it. Hi, hello and welcome to another video by Fernando Muñoz Bernal. Fermube is my name. You can find me as China Teacher one on Twitter. Today, I want to pick on some interesting news from um, the United Nations and its rapporteur's visit to Xinjiang. In a report that will potentially significant have significant geopolitical ramifications, this UN Special Rapporteur on Unilateral Coercive Measures, her name is Professor Alina Dohan, has actually called for the lifting of Western sanctions on China and Xinjiang. This is really very important. Now, her argument is that um, these sanctions, primarily imposed by the United States, of course, under the banner of human rights, are demonstrably causing harm to the very people that they're meant to protect. We've seen this all before. We've seen it in Iran, where US sanctions have crippled the healthcare system. They limit the access to vital medicines and uh, medical equipment. We've seen it in Cuba, where the decades-long U.S. sanctions have stifled economic growth, leading to shortages of basic necessities like food and medicine, which in the end disproportionately impact the most vulnerable people in society, even though the rest of the United Nations have voted to lift these sanctions, but the U.S. just won't do it. So it is important to realize that these intended and planned consequences are now raising serious questions about the efficacy of sanctions as a foreign policy tool and they end up revealing them as the weapon that they are. But back to Dohan's visit to China, her research, which focused mainly on Xinjiang, has yielded concerning findings that regular folk like myself and many others have pointed out before. This Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act of 2021, a U.S. law that automatically assumes the Xinjiang goods are tainted by forced labor, has had a ripple effect in the Uyghur community and its society. Foreign and even domestic Chinese businesses are now wary of participating in Xinjiang link supply chains, fearing sanctions and seizures uh, by American entities. A recent example of this is from early this year, 2024, when thousands of luxury cars from Porsche, Audi and Bentley were actually blocked from entering U.S. ports due to a violation of this Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. An investigation by these U.S. entities revealed that there was a banned electronic component from a supplier in Western China, most likely from a supplier deep down within the car maker supply chain, a tiny little factory, who knows. Now, it is worth noting that Volkswagen has conducted human rights audits as recently as late 2023. But what these US entities do is simply say that, oh, look, the effectiveness and transparency of these audits is to be questioned. That's it. That's how simple it is for them to block products with Xinjiang connections from entering the US. So now Volkswagen is working to replay these parts and try to comply with US normative. However, as, as before, we, we need to ponder how long will these companies continue to die at the cross to maintain their operations in Xinjiang? I, I really don't know. So if you look at BASF, the German company, they, they just called it quits. They closed their joint venture in Xinjiang late last year, I think. And um, even though they, they kept their profitable business in China, a very sizable business, it's just they don't want to be connected to Xinjiang. They don't want the trouble. This is how economic whiplash, as Dohan points out, hurts Xinjiang economy and its people. Uh, on, a, on another page, there is abundant evidence that U.S. sanctions have contributed to civil unrest in many parts of the world. Yet the U.S. entities wash their hands. They simply suggest that, oh, listen, civil unrest is a very complicated thing. It's, it's often 
intertwined with other factors like corruption or political stability or other pre-existing economic vulnerabilities. So they know that this is going to cause these problems, but when they are called out, it's like, oh no, that's, that's, there's other factors to consider. Don't, don't blame us. But anyway, I digress. Dohan's report goes beyond Xinjiang business and it goes a little bit more into the legal quagmire that the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act is based on and, and she also touches a little bit on the effects on global climate initiatives which are affected. The act's uh, presumption of guilt effectively bans Xinjiang imports which disrupt critical global supply chains. Xinjiang is a major producer of polysilicon for solar energy panels, cotton and tomatoes. All of these have been being sanctioned. These sanctions, which are intended as a human rights tool, ironically end up harming economies and green initiatives around the world. Dohan also dwells into the human cost of these sanctions. She talks about businesses that have been forced to slash workforces, some of them actually facing bankruptcy. She notes that the most vulnerable are informal workers, older workers and women. In certain sectors, they are the ones who bear the brunt of the impact on these unfair sanctions. Dohan again and again emphasizes the lack of due process for sanctioned entities. She talks about a case where companies attempt to refute forced labor allegations, presented extensive documentation, more than 10,000 documents were submitted to US authorities, yet they just deemed it insufficient. How, how do you deal with this? How do you win when you are the accuser and the judge at the same time? Continuing on the legal landscape, Dohan argues that these sanctions violate international human rights laws. This really troubling presumption of guilt principle is embedded in Xinjiang-related sanctions. It flies in the face of established legal norms. I have referred to this in the past saying that the Salem trials, you know, the witch trials of Salem, taught Americans absolutely nothing. Presumption of innocence is a foregone thing. It's a thing of the past. But at least it's positive to hear this principle being reinforced from a UN rapporteur. Maybe somebody will finally listen and do something about this. This sanction, as Dohan concludes in her report, cause four things. Economic harm to the people. They disrupt global supply chains that are critical. They lack due process and they violate international law. Dohan report also resonates uh, with Chinese governments as you would imagine, of course. China has long maintained that Western sanctions are simply a form of economic coercion. I call it economic terrorism. They call it economic coercion. All of it just disguise as human rights advocacy. Doha's findings with the imprimatur of a UN body might lend credence to this idea and, and something might be able to be redressed. Now, on a personal note, do I think that Doha's report will lead to lifting of sanctions? No, I don't think this is going to happen. The US and its allies are unlikely to back down. Why would they do that? Particularly with an ongoing concern about losing hegemony around the world and a potential war against China. Why would they make it easy for China? Now, is China concerned with the US closing its doors to Chinese products from Xinjiang? To a certain extent, but at the same time, the Chinese know that the Global South knows America's game as well because the Global South has also been the target in the past. So now this Global South is becoming the largest customer for China's products and tech. It's very interesting to see this chart right here. And this trade does not have to be in US dollars. I mean, it might be at the moment, but steps are being taken to change that. So when you pair this with the de-dollarization, you begin to understand that America's isolation is 
kind of an in, in, inevitable in a way. However, yes, I don't think it's going to change anything, but the report has positively injected a dose of real politic into the international arena, highlighting the economic cost of these measures. The UN Rapporteur's report underscores the complexity, the complex interplay between human rights advocacy, economic considerations and geopolitical competitions as well, as well which I find positive, but uh, no. I do not think that this will pave the way for a more nuanced approach by the United States. American politicians need to continue exacerbating tensions between the US and China because when you think about it, war is the ultimate financial reset if you win it. All right, guys, that's all that we have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. If you want to support the work that I do, hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee as the people who appear here on the screen have done so far this year. Thank you very much to all of you and well until I see you again take it easy and bye for now.